want to start with a scripture verse. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, he says, But thanks be to God who always, say always, always, always leads us to spread his knowledge everywhere like sweet smelling perfume. He's allowed us to be, uh, wherever we go, to, he's with us always. Knowledge in the world. But you know, most of us as believers, as Christians, we want to grow in our Christian life. So we usually go online, we go and search for books and stuff like that to improve our Christian life. We find lots of books on how to make Christian life easier for us. And help us, the believers in the church, to be more acceptable to the world. But the truth of the matter is that there is nothing easy or acceptable about the Christian life. Christian life is not meant to be easy. But our mentality is that, yes, we are saved. should be easy. should be nice. should be rosy. Right? But it's not. And so today we started, started on a little journey. And the journey is that, I want to give you an illustration and a picture. And I want you to visualize this. Because God has called us to, be, to finish the work Jesus started here in the first place. But in this process, He's given us a structure. He's given us the ability to make a difference in the world. And so if we don't grow, what happens to us? It's very and we settle for religion. Or we settle for whatever it is that the world gives us to stand for. And God wants us to say to make a difference in the world. Everything that we think, say and do, is the opposite of what the world encourages us to think, say and do. But, because we have a worldly mentality already, it's hard for us to see the spiritual element that God wants us to experience. And so this is where we lose sight. Because we're trying to fight a spiritual battle with a physical component. And are we going to be successful? No, no, no. Now this is where the Israelites were at. When God called Moses to go get the Israelites out of Egypt. Egypt represents slavery. Right? The bondage that we all fall into because of sin. But then he says, I promise you, I'm going to have you, I'm going to have a promised land for you. Now, what's the promised land? Today, our promised land is eternity and prosperity. We're going to define this right now. Because I want you to visualize, God put you up, took you out of this slavery, promised you a promised land. The prosperity is there. But you know what's standing there? The walls of Jericho. Giants in the land. But that's yours because, as the Bible says, he has already overcome the world. So I want you to stick with me as we go through this because in order for us to experience this, see, Christian life is not an easy walk in the park. Turn to someone and say, it is not an easy walk in the park. We're not in a playground. We are in a battle. Battles. Not a playground. And so often Christians want to be in a playground. That's their mentality. But we have to understand to grow, we need to transform. Turn to someone. In order to grow, you need to transform. Yeah. And in order to impact the world, we have to, they got to experience, we got to experience this transformation. Now this journey to the promised land. It's not a walk in the park. Turn to someone, make sure they heard you. It's not a walk in the park. So what is it? We're going to talk, we're going to be real today because I want you to understand that there are two things, three things we're going to talk about today. There are two main points. And I got some help that I ask people to help me today with this message. God be the glory. Amen. And there are two things that I, I learned in life, in my growth. My transformation came from transformed by truth and transformed by troubles. That's what the makeup of what it takes to be transformed and to be the light of the world. 
And in that transformation, there's no way to accomplish that unless you're obedient. Now, what is the truth of transformation? Well, it's spiritual growth is a process of replacing lies with truth. The world has given you many lies into which you live by. But the truth comes and says, you can't buy into that lie, and now you need to live by the truth. We're going to emphasize what that truth is. Because the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to make us like sons of God. He uses the truth, makes us sons of, of God. Now here's the thing. The Bible says specifically that it was written, the Word was written so that we could study it. Okay? Number one. So make sure that the person next to you heard that. The Scripture was written, the Bible was written, the Word of God was given so that we can watch. And the Bible says study it so you can make yourself approved. Now, transformation comes by obedience. Spiritual transformation is the efforts of what we make to strive to seek and to find what God has given us. Now, the second component of this is that we are transformed by trouble. God uses circumstances to develop our character. So troubles, which in our humanness would always see it and experience it as bad, painful, ugly, don't want that. In a spiritual sense, it's saying you're in a good place. Think about that. In the world, how can this be a good place? It's painful. It's causing me to, you know, not feel too good. In the spiritual, it's telling you what. Are you ready to grow? Are you going to trust me? You see, so we're going to compare the difference between the concept of where we are in the world with the concept we are in the spiritual walk with God. Now, there are not many of us here today, but there may be one who's going to be watching this. And I want you to keep in mind that life, this is going to be, uh, life is a series of problems. That's why the Bible says in this world, Jesus said, you will have what? Troubles, trials, and tribulations, right? Because that's the very thing that's going to help us grow. Because otherwise, we'll grow stagnant. And we're meant to go to another level in our world. Now, I want to take, I want to go to Psalm, verse in Psalm, Psalm, book of Psalms 1 3, and this is what it says. It says, He is like, uh, like a tree planted by the streams of water which yields its fruits in season and whose leaf does not wither, whatever, he says that whatever he does prospers. Now, he uses the analogy of this tree, of a tree that is, that is always, always prospering, no matter what. In Jeremiah, it talks about the same concept of a tree of water. There's a Jer Jeremiah 17, 17, verse 7 through 8, it says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out his roots by the stream. It says, it does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves always green. It has no worries in the year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. When the worst can come, you still bear fruit. But who is he talking about? He says, blessed is the man who what? Trust in the Lord. So in this conflict, when we're talking about in Psalm 1-3, when the scripture says, whatever he does prosper, it does not mean that we are, uh, in, it means immunity to, uh, from failure or from difficulties. Nor is it guaranteed if from health or wealth and happiness. Doesn't sound good, does it? But what does prosperous mean to you? It says that prosperity here, that when we apply God's wisdom, he says the fruit we bear will be good and receives God's approval. 
And that's what we're looking for, folks. Turn to someone. You're looking for God's approval. You're not looking for man's approval. You're not looking to try to strike it rich. You're looking for God's approval. Why is that more important than any of the other thing that the world says it's worth looking for? Eternal. Say it again. Nothing in this world will last. Nothing in this world will last. And in this world, you probably won't be able to keep it all. And if you have a good thing, if you read all the sweet you want over and over and over again, it's no longer going to taste sweet anymore. When God has given us a perspective to always bear good fruit, always be prosper, always be in, in a, with an attitude rather than looking for or feeling an emotional need. And He's looking for us to grow. He wants us to grow beyond anything else. And in Jeremiah, when he says that, he says, well, even in the drought, even when things don't go right, even when things are looking horrible, you will still bear good fruit because of your attitude, because of your perspective. Now, transformed by truth. What do you hear? Because I'm going to have home come up and, or, or trouble. Who wants to go first? <laughs> Transformed by trouble because I love trouble. Trouble has been the place where my greatest growth in life have come. The worst thing that could have ever happened to me in this world has been my greatest success. It's where I grew the most in the world, spiritually. Not when things were going well. It was always in the crisis. But a person who can't see that because they are here in the world, it's hard to see and understand what's in this world. So the Bible says we are in this world, but we are what? And so often we're trying to take what from here and live here. Candidate, it won't work. They don't mix. Now we are supposed to be take what we have here and bring it here. But so often, think about it. We're thinking this way. And we're trying to make sense of this with this. And it doesn't work. So we have to learn and understand how and what is God doing for us to get our perspective right. So I'm going to have one of the young adult leaders, youth leaders come up, and he's going to share a little on Transformed by Children. John 16, 33, in the message. In the New Living, Test, uh, New, Living, New Living Translation, I have told you all this so that you may have peacekeeping in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart, I have come to overcome the world. In chapter 15, Jesus is preparing for his disciples for what is to come. He knows that it's his time to fulfill what he was brought here to do. He speaks of himself as divine, us as the branches, and God is the gardener. In verse 4, if we don't remain in him, we'll never produce fruit. And in verse 7 it says, if we do remain in him, and his word, we will be granted anything we ask of him. At the end of chapter 15, he's explaining to the world, he's explaining that the world will still hate him, even though he's done so many miraculous things. But he's sending the spirit of truth to advocate for us. He's encouraging us to keep the faith in the hard times the difficulties, 
the factors in our lives causing trouble in achieving a positive result or tending to produce a negative result, the trials, annoying, frustrating, or even catastrophic events, the sorrows, something that causes great unhappiness. All pretty, all pretty negative and depressing things to consider, right? Because especially coming from the one who was sent here to save us. But he's telling us to be trusting, inclined to believe or confide in readily, assured, characterized by certainty or scrutiny, or security, excuse me, to be unshakable, marked by firm determination or resolution, to be at peace, absence of mental stress or anxiety, and to, of course, above all, take heart, to receive courage or comfort from some fact, to be confident, to be brave. And why, you ask? That in the midst of all the horrible, terrible, no good, very bad things that will happen in our lives, are we being told to take heart? Because he's conquered the world. That's from the message. From the NL, uh, New Living Translation and the NIV, he's overcome the world. And from the Good News Translation, he's defeated the world. Not future tense, where it's something he will do, but past and present, where it's already been done. Amen. We already have the victory. Amen. John 16, 11, judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. I did a devotional a few weeks ago for the basketball ministry where I was blessed to share how my God is bigger than anything this world could put forth. And for me, where difficulties, trials, and sorrows were being restricted from moving on with my life for four to almost five years. And uh, even while loving and serving the Lord, going to court and having someone preventing me from moving on, that unsettling feeling inside, knowing my life is out of my control and in someone else's, the thousands and thousands of dollars of my hard-earned money going to uh, lawyers, because that's what they do. Okay? And anyone who knows anything about the court system, it is the most miserable, depressing, discouraging process I have ever gone through. And me personally, I've lived a pretty worldly life at one point. But my God was bigger. Once I released my life to him, instead of trying to control it myself, I was able to settle those issues that plagued me. Bought a home, married the beautiful Diana, and uh, we began to move on. And right when I'm about to move forward and move into my new home, suddenly I'm in need of emergency spinal surgery on top of being taken to court yet again to prevent Allie from moving, in, from moving with me. More difficulties, more trials, more sorrows. Romans 8.28, God works all things out for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. My God is bigger than anything this world can put forth. I now knew how to trust him. He gave me indescribable peace and indescribable joy. On top of being provided with more than enough money, you know, being out of work for seven weeks, during the Christmas season, I might add, and on the date of my, uh, and the date of my, uh, to finally went to court, missing work on my first week back, waiting two hours for this individual and her attorney to show, I'm told by this person she's not showing up, and neither was the attorney. With the attorney. I didn't have to be there, she says. But I had such peace that day, such joy. I knew God already had handled everything in advance. And instead of just leaving, I stayed, I spoke to the judge, where if I would have left, I'd still be involved in that case, and it has been totally dismissed. Amen, right? Amen. But I know that there will be more trials and hard times ahead of me and my family. But why would I worry? Why would I fret? I already have the victory. Amen. Amen. Has anyone ever heard of Yelp? Yelp. 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 It's a website where okay. you can write a review on any kind of business. Okay? If you're looking for anything from takeout to something to clean your carpets, Yelp has the reviews, whether good or bad, to help you choose the right person for your job. Okay? Jesus Yelped our Father over 2,000 years ago. He's the reason I turn to God no matter what I'm going through, knowing God will always come through and will never disappoint. Yeah. My God is the best reviews. Yeah. 1 Peter 4. 12 to 13, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through, as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering, so you have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it's revealed to the world. Amen? Amen. Transformed by troubles. 
You know, troubles is what takes you to another level in our walk. I was sharing something with someone the other day um, that, you know, without these particular trials, uh, we are, it's hard for us to experience God's grace, mercy, and even power because we can only, we only be limited unless he reveals a certain truth. And so, but that was transformed by troubles. Now we have transformed by truth. Amen. Hallelujah. Doing out there, very well. Sitting on new cushion seats and <laughs> very nice, very nice. Amen. Okay, so I'm um, called and asked to do a meditation. I'm going to do a meditation on John 4:24, um, using the P word method, as we all know, proclaim, our pray, picture, personalize, probe, and pray. I will transition, I'm going to do it a little differently. I'm going to transition through the P's unannounced. I leave it up to you, my brilliant brothers and sisters in Christ, <laughs> to determine which P phase I'm in. Amen? Amen. 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 And the Lord gave me a vision of true worship when he told me, God the Father is the supreme spiritual being, creator of all things, seen and unseen. And those who want to show genuine respect for his awesomeness and his exceeding goodness to them must do so from their heart, inner man, or their true self, which is spirit. He told me relationship with him as his child is one as free of hypocrisy as humanly possible. I say humanly because in spite of it all, we all in our humanity, sinful nature, try to hold back something, though he knows it all. He said, however, the true worshipers come to him without shame because he is love. And then I asked him, what does it look like? And he told me, it looks like many things in life. True worship looks like a little bird who sings praise whether he is in a cage or free. Many think uh, true worship uh, because he has a song to sing to his creator. He told me it looks like a faithful beloved dog who sleeps at the foot of his owner be to be in his presence and be a faithful companion. It's seen in countless human relationships marital, familial, and friendships where, the, where, there, where there is trust and respect and honesty without reproach, total acceptance, unconditional love. True worship in spirit doesn't depend on a place or a time or style of dress, but it's a heart attitude of reverence and joy at all times and at any time. In a way, I believe we at Living Word are blessed that we do not have a building because then we come to worship out of a sense of sincere uh, worship of the Father with an, with an assembly and not to go to a particular place. Then I asked the Lord 